So when I was putting together for my business, the mission statement and the vision statement, everything from my gut and my soul, I genuinely believe when it's delivered correctly, that sales and, and customer service is exactly the same thing. There's no line. So, you know, if somebody doesn't need it, don't sell it. This is the Ideas Lab podcast, where you can learn from great creative and entrepreneurial minds how to turn your ideas into original businesses, books, and brands. Because in a crowded world, it pays to stand out. This is your host, John Williams, best selling author and founder of the Ideas Lab London. If you want to make money, you need to know how to sell. But for a lot of us, our image of a salesperson is not a good one. So I was pleased to be able to have Alison Edgar on the podcast so that we could talk over what ethical sales really looks like. And how do you sell to different personalities in a way that suits them all? We also explore the ethics of those large self-development and business training workshops with charismatic speaker on stage, encouraging participants to run to the back of the room and buy as soon as they can. Hello, Alison. Thank you for joining us. I heard that you've been described or you describe yourself as the entrepreneur's godmother, but I think you'll need to explain what that is. Hi, John. Thank you so much for having me. So I didn't actually name myself that. It came about from one of my clients And at the time, I was splitting my brand. So the the main sort of bread and butter side of the business is sales coaching solutions, and it works with teams. And there used to be government funding that helped me to work with the teams. But when the government changed the support landscape in the UK, it left the startups and the micro businesses without really the capability and capacity for that support. So I decided to create a, a, a sort of more to many model online courses. I wrote the book and like the things that were more affordable, but I needed a separate name for it. I felt that like Alice and Edgar wasn't punchy enough. So I've got a client, Ross Butler, who makes Butler's gin, a lovely gin, but he's such a naughty, naughty boy. He's a young entrepreneur. And I phoned him and he's really creative. And I said, look, I really need a name for this personal brand. And he like, In one sentence, he said, that's just so easy. You're the entrepreneur's godmother. And when I Googled what godmother is, it's someone who is influential in an organisation or in a person's life. And I thought, that's me. I am the entrepreneur's godmother. So it stuck really and trademarked that. And then that was us. Although I'll tell you, do you want the first little thing that's the most common thing that happens People don't read the word godmother properly and they call me the entrepreneur's grandmother. So again, I have to laugh and smile, but it is godmother rather than I'm, I'm nobody's grandmother. And godmother still has a different different connotation from godfather, which would be a whole different thing. Well, it's really interesting you say that because, again, I always wear pink. I, I'm quite, you know, I'm bubbly, I'm Scottish and, and you know, I have been known, John, to have a wand and a tiara. So I have been known. But actually, when people work with me, they think, oh, is it all like sweetness and light and, you know, hearts and flowers? And I'm like, no, there are times that I potentially could put the horse's head in the bed. I have to be tough as the godmother as well to keep people accountable. So, you know, a combination between horsey head and tiara and wand. You can imagine that. Well, that conjures up, but there we go. So um, I'm fascinated about this topic of sales. I did go on on a course recently on sales, and um, I am actually uh, got to a point where I'm quite good at it, I think, because I seem sort of 80% of the people I actually speak to on the phone end up buying the courses I'm talking to them about. And and so I'm not bad, but there's always more you can learn. But I know a lot of people just think sales is – their image of sales is vile. It's like the cheesy car lot salesperson. It's about conning somebody. It's about high pressure. And I know a lot of people who follow me, read my books and so on. Um, they hate that kind of stuff. So it, it, it does, is it, are we, if we talk to them about sales and teach them a bit about sales, are they going to turn into some sort of monster? 
No, do you know what? I don't blame them for hating that sort of stuff. I hate that sort of stuff as well. It's horrible. And that's so many people do not know how to sell properly. And it's, it, I don't know whether I feel it's getting worse or it's getting better, but it's, it's, it's awful. It's not, you know, 1984. We don't need to be getting things thrown in our face. It's horrible. So initially prior to sales, my background was hospitality. So I worked in Cape Town for Southern Suns. I worked for Radisson in Sydney. So I was a hotelier really at heart. Um, and I kind of fell into sales more by luck or chance or whatever you want to call it. And it was when I met my husband, when I came back from six years traveling, he's a software developer. So he works Monday to Friday, nine to five. So I had to find a day job, not shifts, or I was going to get dumped. And I really quite liked this one was a keeper, Johnny was a keeper. So I had to find a job that was nine to five. So I was actually trained by BT. So I worked um, in one of the first BT call centers um, and this was, again, back in the early 90s. And from day one in that role after the training, I was the top performer. I won the prizes. I went to the beauty tower. You know, I, I, I just seemed to really embrace it well. And I think, in fact, I don't think I know the reason that I was so good was actually I took the combination of hospitality and what I'd learned and I combined them. So when I was putting together for my business, the mission statement and the vision statement, everything from my, you know, from my gut and my soul, I genuinely believe when it's delivered correctly, that sales and, and customer service is exactly the same thing. There's no line. So, you know, if somebody doesn't need it, don't sell it. And I think that's a top tip that it's all these people that are just throwing things out and you can buy this and you can do it and, and if they don't need it, don't sell it. So that's, I think, where the icky, yucky bleh comes from. Actually, a, a proper consultative asking really good questions, that type of sale is is how it should be done. And again, that's that's my you know vision to be the Adele of sales training and to teach people all over the world. So I think that's you know really important for the listeners to get across. Yeah, it's quite mind-bending, isn't it? When I heard somebody say selling is helping, I was like, wait, what? But I've had people on the phone who, I, sometimes when I'm speaking to people about about uh, my courses, um, I think, well, you know, th- yeah, they will benefit, and and I mean, I'll definitely get their money's worth. Um, but that's okay, and it's sort of you know, it, it's a they should join. However, there's other people who just go, oh my god, if they don't join, that is insane. That's a crime, and then they don't, and that's and what I consider that to be a. A, the, a failure of me as a salesperson and it's not done them any good because 100% those people that I feel very passionate about they go away and they don't achieve the result they wanted to achieve that they were talking to me about no and I think that feeds into what we were talking about um pre-record was around the behaviors that you know the part of the book around the different how different people buy how different people react and I think that's where you know, fundamentally, so the methodology that I created and talk about in the book is the four key pillars of sales. So the first thing is we look at behaviours, like finds like, people buy people who are like them. The next thing is sales process, then sales strategy. And the thing that I come across most, especially in small businesses, is confidence. People really struggle with confidence. And I think, again, it comes back to what you're saying, that they've got this mindset that it's horrible, it's dirty. Oh, I don't want to be seen as pushy. Um, but when they know the other, you know, the behaviours, the process and the strategy, confidence comes. But the first thing I teach in every course, you know, everything I do is around the DISC behaviours and how um, it's about ad- adaptation to the person that you're selling to. And I think that's just the key and the fundamental. That's really interesting. And that's what's fascinating about your book, um, remind me of a name because I just downloaded it last night. Uh, that's all right. Look here, I even have a copy. Secrets Successful Sales. Let's see, that's marketing, good marketing that is. Yes, yeah, Secrets Successful Sales. And what's fascinating is that, yes, it teaches you about sales, which is a good thing to understand. But this, this using the DISC personality profile model is really interesting because what you're saying is if you broadly categorize people into four different flavors of people and what motivates them you need to sell to them differently is that right yeah and I think that's where again 
sort of it's it, how how I use it. It's not my you know I'll put my hands up. It's based on Carl. Again, this is where the Scottish thing comes in. Carl Jung's psychology in Scotland. We say Carl Jung's psychology, but Carl Jung's psychology. Um, and then the tool that I use is by William Moulton Marston. So it's that that's the the, the hindsight behind it. Um, but what we do, it's colour based. So you look at extroverts, introverts, task and relationship focused. So I think this is, again, if you come back to the people who think it's all dirty and it's horrible for, for you know, the, the heads and tails of that, there's actually other people who love sales. They want you to be quick. You want it like, bye, sell to me. So, you know, it's not all, you know, everybody's different. And it's really identifying because if you are too consultative with the greens, the relationship focused introverts, you're going to lose them. You know, and if you're too fast, you know, too slow with the, the reds, the task focused extroverts, by too, being too slow, you're going to lose them as well. So you've got to identify, A, where do you sit? You know, where, what's your behaviours? Are you an extrovert, introvert, task or relationship because you need to know where, where to start as to how to adapt and how to identify where you're selling to. So it's fascinating. And if we go through the four colours then, can you describe them a little bit? Yeah. So I'll give you a little, again, this will be really good for the listeners. I'll give them an overview. If they are listening, this is the heads up. Get a pad and a pen, right? Are you ready, guys? Get a pad and a pen. And on the pad, draw um, a cross, a line down the way, a line the cross, vertical, horizontal. At the top of your cross, write task focused. At the bottom, relationship focused. On the right hand side of your cross, write extrovert. And on the left hand side of your cross, write introvert. So you now have a cross with a little bit of shape. In the top right hand corner, draw or write red. So to try and really envelope this for you, what I'm going to do is I'm hypothetically going to take you back to school and I'm hypothetically going to give you a 30 minute English test. So for those of you who've left school a long time ago, don't worry, you're not going back. And what will happen after 20 minutes, someone in your classroom, so 20 minutes in, will put up their hand and go, miss, miss, I'm finished. I'm a winner. You're losers. I'm bored now. But when the test results come back, they don't realise there was another side to the paper. So for them, it's just about getting the task done and it doesn't matter about the detail. So, again, these are the people you will meet in life. And, again, a lot of the time, these are the pushy sales because they're just going for the result rather than the relationship because they're task-focused. And this is, these are red people, are they? These are the reds, yeah. And also think about emails. So these are the people, again, even in a, a, a team perspective or, a, you know, interactive by email. These are the people who probably don't say please or thank you. They just go FYI. And it's not because they're rude. It's just because they're task-focused extroverts. They just want to get on with it. Then we go back to our classroom and back to your pad and piece of paper. On the bottom right you'll have the relationship-focused extroverts. And if you write in that box, yellow, then what will happen is back to your classroom after 10 minutes. So the test has just really started, hasn't it? The yellow will be like, oh, John, oh, I love that clock. Oh, I love that. Oh, where did you get that? Oh, I know that. Oh, my clock. Tinchy Strider's got my clock. Do you know Tinchy Strider? Alison McCall, can you get on with the test? <gasps> I forgot there was a test. We were busy talking about clocks and Tinchy Strider. So again, for the yellows, they're full of enthusiasm. And again, they give you all the right noises, but they're like Dory the fish. They forget. So they're popular. But again, from a sales perspective, they're quite hard to pin down because they get easily distracted. Um, so that's our extroverts. Then going back to your pad. On the left-hand side, you'll have the greens. They're the relationship-focused introverts. So already, my tone, my pace, and my gesturing is just a little bit slower because the greens 
are introverts, so they don't want to stand out. They also do this thing where they engage their brain before they speak. They think about things, not like the extroverts who just bring it out. They they, um, process internally. So go back to our test. After 10 minutes, the green will notice that John's got a headache. Miss, miss, my friend John's got a headache. I think we should go to the nurse. So they'll slope out of the classroom, but no one will know they've gone. So not like the yellows where they disrupt to make attention for themselves. The greens do it because they genuinely care more about the headache than they do the test. So again, they are harmonic, they're social, but they don't like change and they don't like confrontation. So again, if a lot of your listeners, you know, potentially are in this green space, that might be why they just, they don't like sales because they see it as confrontational. Um, We then go back to the blues. So the blues are the relationship focus. So on your pad, that's the top left relationship blue, uh, sorry, task focused uh, introverts. That's what happens when I'm doing it without the pad in front of. So the blues in the test, right up to the last second, checking their work, double checking. Did I cross my eye? Did I dot my T? They strive for perfection. And even if they got the A or the A star star, they're not running around the classroom. They have to just prove to themselves, not to anyone else. So we're obviously all a blend of these colours, but... You know, usually at this point, I'll say, has anybody ever met someone they don't get on with? And usually I get 100% of hands, John, and it's usually the diagonal. So if you're the red, fast, furious, let's get it done. It's the slow paced, airy, shady green that you'll struggle to build the relationship with. If you're leading the Disney parade in the yellow corner, it's the dull, boring blues that you don't build the relationship with. If you're down here in Kerry Sherry, Greenland, and you just want everything to be harmonic, it's the pushy, pushy reds that you don't build the relationship. And if you're up here in blue, where everything has to be dotted and crossed and sombre and serious, it's those annoying yellow flies that never shut up. So you can see from that, people buy people and they buy people like them. So the art is in the adaption. Right. And so when you're selling to these people, you have to change the speed at which you move and the and the information you give. Is is that what it's about? Yeah. So like say you're a blue and you're really detailed, you want to give the ins and outs. A yellow a yellow doesn't want to hear that. They think that's boring. They don't want to know. They just don't want to know the fun parts, what's in it for them. And you know, and it's bigging up the experience for them will make them buy. Whereas And this is, again, it's interesting because people say to me, what do you think the best colour for sales is? And I'm like, "Hmm, the one that can adapt. Because if you look then at a yellow, you know, yellows can be in your face, really, really in your face. And the blues, it just, you know, you can watch them physically cringe. And they don't mean it. It's their micro expressions when the yellows start to go off on one. And then the yellows don't listen. So the blues have to repeat the answer and you can see the frustration start to come out as well. So it's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating topic. Yeah, that is, that, that is interesting. And I guess that means, um, and I'm just trying to think of, of my own examples because what I've noticed is that it, it is quite possible to sell some people with very little detail about what they're getting. They're buying into an experience and a, and a vision and so on. Unfortunately, that can be somewhat abused by unscrupulous people in my space. Yes. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I'm so glad that you said that. That Yes, run to the back. They're there. They've got the card in their hand. They don't even know what they're buying. Yeah, oh, I've, I've, I've seen somebody who had who is selling a... I think I think the the mentorship for one year was it's probably now eighteen thousand dollars, and you read you read the T's and C's that you sign, and on the back it, it says we promise nothing. I mean, really, there's nothing included for definite. <laughs> it's just remarkable. And it's interesting because if you look at those kind of events, John, I mean, this is like I've got a real kind of be my bonnet around all this stuff because it is the hype, all that hype is towards the extroverts. That's why there is the, you know, the NLP position. Yay! You know, it's your life. Yeah. 
you know, and, and all that subliminal messaging and, you know, the hype and the, yeah, let's get this party started. You know, these people, just as soon as they walk in the door, are getting really sold to. And that's, you know, they don't even know they're being sold to. They don't even know. In fact, and, that, and some of them don't even care. They just get so enthralled by it. So when the trigger signal comes in, you know, oh, you know, do you wish your life was better? Do you wish you were making more money? Do you wish you had a six-figure sum? Oh, why don't you wish you had a seven? Oh, you don't have that. You've got no food on the table. If you spend that $18,000, you too could be on the beach every day in your villa. Spend the money with me. Run to the back. Ooh, oh, bad sales. But people do it. I, I, oh. But that's where, that's all targeted towards the reds and the yellows. The green and blue don't, they either don't attend. So the reds and yellows are both extrovert. Yes. So it's positioned for them. Whereas if you look at, you know, the blues would read the T's and C's and they wouldn't run to the back. And so, and then, but then again, it's really interesting because when people don't know the behaviours, they go, oh, those people, they're really hard work. Oh, I don't really want to work with them. Actually, it's because you don't understand them. If you can win them over because you know, you really do have a, a proper tangible value, they will buy, or if you can be patient and really win them over and explain and give them time to think, they will. And that's not what those events are geared for. They're all geared for the yellows and the reds. Yeah, which is interesting, which means that if you're more introverted, there is an, an opportunity to to be different and to sell to people in a different way and to attract a different audience, which is your kind of person. Because at the moment, the live event kind of model we're talking about, the big rooms of hundreds of people in, run to the back of the room, the whole model is designed by extroverts for extroverts. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, definitely. And it's because a green won't make a decision without speaking to someone else. Okay, they won't make a decision because they fear uh, change and they fear of getting it wrong, but not... What the, the blues fear in getting it wrong in case they've made a mistake because they thrive themselves in there, whereas the green underlyingly would go $18,000, but that might be my kid's college fund. And what would they do? And and how's and how's Johnny going to get there? And, and, and what happens if he get married? What happens if they have children? How, who, what, what's, how are they going to afford their first house? They're busy running through about other people, not themselves. So they will want... Um, Proof, again, the blues will want proof. Um, the greens will probably want social proof, uh, but I'm more around how it affected somebody's life, not that they've made a shed load of money because the relationship focused it's how that meant that their kid could go to college and they didn't get a chance or how it meant that the, you know, their grandson could have a christening party. Whatever it is, that's what it is. But they will not make a decision before having run it through somebody else in case they get it wrong. The Reds are a great example of the run to the back because they will run to the back. because, And it's not because they want to get whatever it is that's been sold. They want to be first. They're so competitive. <laughs> but what they, they will then realise is, hang on, I've not read the T's and C's. And they will try and cancel because they'll have buyer's remorse because they don't really know what they've bought. It was just about winning and buying it. And that's where buyer's remorse starts to come into play as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it's it would be easy <clears throat> to assume that if somebody um, didn't uh, – uh, if somebody asks, starts asking lots of detailed questions, then you would imagine that, that means that they're not happy in some way or they're doubting you. So because a lot of people will buy just based on trust. So I guess these are yellow people who are extrovert relationship people. If they like you, they will buy – and they don't ask about the detail. It can then be quite surprising when you get a blue person who's an introvert, task-focused, detail-focused, because they're going to go, well, how long are the sessions? And exactly how many weeks is it? Is it 12 weeks or is it three months? And you just go like, what difference does that make? And that got, but it matters to them. And so it would be easy to think that they're kind of, they're skeptical and they're arguing. Yeah. But in actual fact, that's not the case. It's not, and it's really interesting because this came up, I can't remember, literally, it's happened this week and somebody's like, oh, you know, we just always think they're troublemakers, you know, they're looking to cause trouble. It's not, they just think and they buy in a different way. But the part of the problem, especially for that run to the back, you know, whoa, is most of the people that are in that space are yellow-red and they haven't really got any attention to detail and that's not how they buy. And they, they frown upon the introverts because they buy in a different way. And I think... You know, if you look at, you know, one of the 
the things that we started off with is sales being icky and yucky. Uh, you know, that a lot of that will come from the left hand side, from you know, the introverted side. That's why they feel like that. And it's because these, you know, extrovert people are throwing things in their face and that's what puts them off sales. So, you know, you can fully understand uh, from all the sides in this one. Yeah. And there is a way of, and, and yeah, it, it, it's great when you realise that um, that's, selling has a lot to do with asking questions and understanding somebody and their motivations. Completely. And uh, do you know what's really interesting? So for me and, and the business model, I do a lot of speaking at different types of events. And, you know, I, the reason I know so much about this, run to the back. When I was doing all the research for the Entrepreneur's Godmother model, I had to look at the different ways of the too many. How can I, you know, how can I? And again, I hate it. I'm not a fan of this because I genuinely believe sales and customer service is exactly the same thing. But, you know, the way that, again, sometimes this is contrived in that space of, it, you know, you have to do that because you're serving someone. You just have to say, and that's like, well, that's not really what I kind of mean by my messaging. But it's it makes you kind of feel that by not running to the back that you can't serve people, which, again, is really quite contrived in there as well. Um, but I do think, so for me, what's happened is, you know, we, um, we get people who come to the event, they go on the database, we'll usually do some sort of offer at the back, not at the back, but we'll do some sort of offer, but without the, oh my God, this price is 6,000 or it could be 5,000 or it could be 3,000. If you buy today, you can have a free this. It's like, look, this is the coaching package. If you do this, you can have a free copy of the book. So nothing hardcore um, NLP positioned, but we keep them on the base. And if people buy one, great. If they don't, that again, I've got lots of sides to the business that generate more money than the godmother, if that makes sense. This is just, really a, a low cost model to help more people um and now i get people that come back like two years later two years oh actually i want to come on your course two years it's taking them two years to think about it and that's what i mean you're not in their face all the time with an email in the inbox every day buy it now you'll get a deal buy it now you'll get a deal it's you know they need time to think they probably need to check with their wife their husband their dog their granny their hamster and that again that's it, you have to be prepared for the slow at that side. And, it take- and I think that can really pay off. So, I mean, it, there are two routes you can go down because it, increasingly you see some of the skilled internet marketers will make you an offer in a Facebook ad. You'll go onto their email list and then they will email you every goddamn day until you either scream and unsubscribe or buy something. And then, so it's very much a sort of you enter, and then they're gonna, you're either gonna burn out or you're gonna buy. And, and then there's the other type, you know, Seth Godin is the ultimate example, which is like just do good work for your entire life. <laughs> and people start to rave about you and respect you, and you build up this body of work and this trust. He says trust is a big currency. So, but when you have a course come along, and he does online courses now, it sells out in no time, and he doesn't, have to go heavy on the um, the scarcity. Uh, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, for me, I, a lot of small business owners don't know the difference between sales and marketing. So that's one of the things that I try and bring out really early doors in everybody that I work with. What is the difference between sales and marketing then? So um, I compare it to golf because I used to play for golf for the West of Scotland. So in my opinion, marketing, they put the tea in the ground and they put the ball on the tee. So that's your website, that's your emails, that's your social, that's your um, funneling, that's all marketing. And then what happens us in sales, so this is when sales starts when the person, the, the face-to-face, the real interaction that's not electronic kicks into play. So we take it down the fairway, put it in the green and put it in the hole because only when the ball goes in the hole do you make any money? So that's the the ball going in the hole signifies the money. And if I do this in a live course, you usually get somebody from marketing who'll go, no, I I disagree. Okay, come on then, tell me why you disagree. Well, us in marketing, we put the T in, we put the ball in, we put it right up to the edge of the hole and you tap it in, you sales guys, and you take all the glory. And, you know, coming back to Seth Gordon's point, You know, if your marketing's good, you're not far away. The other thing is, um, if you look at Amazon and eBay, to me, that's not sales at all. 
That's a hole in one for marketing. You know, there's no human interaction. I want to buy a copy of Alison Edgar's book, for example. Uh, you just jump in there. And uh, so if somebody bought a book as a result of this, this is not sales. This is purely all marketing. So um, and I think, again, the whole get rich quick concept you know, stop trading your time for money. You can just live on the beach for, you know, do all that. The money just drops in. And I do believe like the Seth Gordon uh, side of things that if you've really, you're good at what you do, people think you're good, you've worked hard, people are, are clambering to buy your stuff, not because you're, you know, doing it on an offer or you know, run to the back, that that is a possibility. But what people don't see, again, it's a bit like music, isn't it? Oh my goodness, like, you know, this person's music's really great. They don't see the kid in year seven at school learning to, you know, take his fingers off while he plays the guitar. You know, you don't become the Rolling Stones overnight, or the Beatles overnight. And, you know, that's if you look at those people who have really carved a path to me in that arena that people are clambering to get their stuff. And it's, you know, Seth Golden, Brene Brown, Mel Robbins, Tony Robbins. You know, it's all these people who touch, you know, again, and I go, and again, this is another interesting. I could talk all day, John. I know we must be running out of time, but if you look at uh, the the US type of market compared to the UK market, you know the US have been brought up. A lot of it is Disney, and I'm not saying there's no introverts in the states, but there's a high percentage of yellow reds, so they love all that. Whereas in the UK, we have got that more reserved side of things, so it's easier to become a rock god in sales and marketing in the US than it is to become a rock god in the UK because we have got that cynical and there's a, a lot of um, reservedness. So that's where I'm seeing the comparison and, and where it all fits in together. Yeah, yeah, that's important, isn't it? It is culturally specific. And, and, and an important point that you can't just follow someone's last part of that path, whether it's sales or even the last part of marketing, and expect it to work for you because... It is in like a lot of these direct marketers who became internet marketers, they will say, Hey, I did this thing and look, I made a million dollars in one weekend. And you go, Yeah, but that's because you're Frank Kern and everyone's heard of you in, in the marketing world anyway. So, uh, you know, that works because you're Frank Kern and we trust that Frank Kern is generally a pretty good guy. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't work if a n of a nobody does that. You've got to use different things. No, and I mean, I, again, I'm complete agreement with that one. And I think if you look at, um, you know, there's a lot of people who tell you how to make millions from, uh, you know, whatever it is, funneling or blah, 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 blah. And coming back to the what we were saying is that bombardment of emails. So you they know that they're going to have a high percentage of unsubscribes. So if their database is 3 million, they don't care. If your database is 20 and you start doing that, you're blowing all your bridges. But that's the that's to me the missing link. They don't say they tell you how they did it, but they don't tell you how to get your database from 10 to 10 million. Because statistically, if you follow what they're telling you to do, you're going to do more harm to your reputation than good. Yeah. Better to be the person a certain kind of person likes and trusts, you know, over the long term. Yeah, and I do think, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of the, um, when I was doing the research for the Entrepreneur's Godmother, so I think that was maybe three or four years ago, I think I, I had, I, when I went to one of these events, I had never seen anything like it in my life. I was in complete and utter shock. I, I, I was like, what on earth is going on? I, I'd never, like, I don't know, because I'd worked in corporate, that all that sort of stuff was sort of provided around sales and, and it, it just never had hit my radar. So I think I kind of got the tail end, but I was working in, um, I've been doing some work in the Middle East. I've been working in Dubai and Kuwait and it's kind of just landing there. So it's really funny. So a lot of the names that UK based run to the back people are now fading it out in the UK because people have just cottoned on and it's, you know, it's just a big con really. So, but in, in the Middle East, there they are. All the names are popping up. They're starting it there. They're all running to the back. So again, you know, it seems to have moved off from the States through Europe and now it's headed off to the East. So good luck. You know, it works for some people. It's just that in the minority, in my opinion, the ones it works for. A friend of mine yesterday described um, 
Dubai as having been rinsed already. So uh, there was a massive influx of people going in there to do um, to do various trainings and things like that around self help and business and whatever. And he feels like that's already on the on the ebb in Dubai, but there are other countries in the Middle East for it. Yeah, I think because that yeah, Dubai's a wee bit more Western, isn't it? But definitely things like Kuwait and you know those kind of areas, they're all loving their run to the bag. Yeah, and you know some of those people are not completely um, unethical, despite their sales methods. You know some of the things you actually buy actually might do you some good. So it's not like you know I wouldn't want to make out that's always evil to do. No. That's the thing, like, but this is the other thing that I will add into this. It's not that the programs don't work, it's the fact that people don't action the programs. You know, that's the thing as well. So, although we say that, I, you know, and I think hopefully the message isn't that it's all, you know, I did say a big con, I don't mean that's all a big con, but um, with, with a lot of those people, you can make it work if you look at um, so look at Russell um, Brunson. So, Russell Brunson came through the Stu McLaren School of teachings and again I would say that Stu McLaren's probably one of the big instigators in this space and what he you know it's not unethical because what he's telling you is what he did and it worked for somebody like Russell Brunson who's come through that and it works for him so he teaches what he did but did it work for Jenny Brown who invested her kids college fund and A hasn't had the capability and B hasn't done anything no it didn't you know, where, where I sit, I, I feel differently. A, I would never charge that rate, and it's not because I don't value what I do. But B, if that was Jenny's college fund and she really hadn't, I wouldn't be pulling up T's and C's. If she couldn't put food on the kids' table, I would just give her her money back. I don't, you know, I, and I think that's where I hear some horror stories from the, you know, that that part, that part. So it's not that it doesn't work. You people don't, most people don't. But it's the horror stories, I think, it give it a lot of the bad reputation. I've definitely seen that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that's fascinating. And um, if people want to learn more about you, I guess one of the recommendations is to get Secrets of Successful Sales, which it does look really good, actually. Um, and it's currently, it's really cheap, isn't it, on Amazon? I think it's on special offer. Yeah, it's on Amazon at the moment. Probably by the time this goes out, it'll be back up. We Because it was on BookBub, BookBub chose it for its featured book. We reduced the price because um, they featured it around the world and we knew that we would get to number one. And that's a great thing for marketing, international bestseller. Um, so, yeah, if they want anything from me, run to the bar. <laughs> only joking, only joking. Um, if they want anything, I'm very active on LinkedIn. That's probably my biggest platform, Alison Edgar. On Instagram and on Twitter, it's at the Alison Edgar. On Facebook, it's Entrepreneur's Godmother. And the website's www.entrepreneursgodmother.com or alisonedgar.com. Uh, or literally just Google me. I, I think I own the first five pages of Google under that name. Oh, wow. Okay, that's good. That's great. Well, that's been really interesting. And we've, um, it's been a good discussion about the current state of sales and marketing and also how to tune it so that it works for everybody, which I think is a good cause. Yeah, I think, I think we've been quite controversial in there as well. We might get some of the haters on this one, John. That might happen. Yeah, some Russell Brunson fans. I quite like Russell Brunson, actually. For All these people have their place. Most of them, there are some really unethical ones, but most of them have their place. It's just the... Uh, Overpromising. You know, there's nothing wrong with making money in an ethical way. Nothing. In fact, you know, if you don't make money, if you don't sell, you don't have a business, you can't put food on the table. It's good for the economy to make money. And, you know, there are some people out there who do it geniusly and the model definitely does work. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Alison. Thanks for having me, Joel. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Ideas Lab podcast. Please do subscribe. And if you've enjoyed this episode, it would be great if you could leave us a review. You can get links and details of everything mentioned in the podcast in the show notes, along with photos and video clips from many of our episodes. Just go to theideaslab.org forward slash podcast. Podcast.